Now in this short video, we're going to consider that special case, the case where our Dirichlet data is not equal to zero. And this is going to introduce a little bit of an issue. And that's something I'll illustrate first. And I think here the one dimensional case suffices. Uh, now, just to be very clear, I think the, the case that GD is not equal to zero is a very relevant case. In many cases, we want to specify non-zero Dirichlet data. We want to specify a displacement of a structure, right? If I'm talking about solid mechanics or in the case of fluid mechanics, we might want to specify an inflow and that's going to be a Dirichlet condition. So in the one dimensional case here, we might consider uh, that we, we have a solution or we're looking for a solution U such that at X is equal to zero, it's equal to one and at X is equal to the length of our domain L, uh, we know that the solution is going to be equal to two. That's a boundary value problem. So in the previous case, what we did was we simply defined H10, the, 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 the subspace of H1 uh, with the condition that the function was equal to zero on the Dirichlet uh, boundary. So you might say, well, why don't we just simply do the same thing? Why don't we specify H1GD? And I would like to pose the following question then. Does the space or does the Sobolev space H1GD exist? I would like to pause for a second and, and think about this question. Does this Sobolev space exist? And I'll already give you a little bit of a hint. It's not going to depend on the differential operators. It's going to be something more fundamental. Uh, we had this stack of different definitions of sets and function spaces. And actually pretty high up the stack, we're going to have a problem. Yeah, so please think about this for a second and I'll, I'll continue right away. So now clearly the answer is going to be no, else I wouldn't be posing this question. Now, why not? Okay, so what we said is Sobolev spaces are uh, special cases of these Lebesgue spaces with additional regularity, right? The functions have to be, uh, we have to be able to take a derivative. Now, Lebesgue spaces and specifically the L2 spaces, they were Hilbert spaces. We could define an inner product that defined the norm of the Banach space. And Banach spaces were vector spaces. And vector spaces seem to be almost trivial, right? These were these spaces that were linear. Uh, if we take two different items of a vector space, we add them together, then the, the result has to be in the vector space. So that seemed almost trivial, uh, but that's actually not the case for this space. Yeah, and that is because If I take u, u and I take v and I add them together, then the result is not in H1GD uh, for any, actually for anyone, any choice of u and any choice of v in H1GD. Now, why is that not the case? Well, I can actually take an example and I'll draw it once and then it's immediately clear. So I'm going to take any function u in my space. So, well, it has to satisfy the boundary conditions, right? That's what we said with the subscript g of d. Uh, so maybe I'll use this function. And maybe as my second function, I'll, I'll, I'll use this function. It really doesn't matter too much. So that's going to be u and v, right? So this is going to be v and maybe this was u. So if I add those together, uh, then uh, I, I should get something that looks like this. Well, let's be a little bit more specific. Where the addition of u and v is going to have the value u, uh, u plus v is equal to 2 on the left and u plus v is equal to 4 on the right. Yeah? That's because both u and v are satisfy these, these values on these boundaries, so their sum is going to be equal to the double of those values, which means that it's no longer a function of h1gd. Now, why is this so important? Uh, well, actually, all the functional analysis is going to build on, these, uh, on, the, on the notion that we're dealing with uh, Hilbert spaces, which are Banach spaces, which are vector spaces. So a lot of the proofs, even though it might not uh, seem that explicit, uh, seem that important, a lot of the proofs are, are going to be based on this, right? 
specifically the whole concept of linearity was based on that we're dealing with vector spaces, right? We had these examples of, of uh, uh, functions that were actually not linear, uh, but they looked very linear. And that was because uh, their domains and codomains uh, were not vector spaces, didn't satisfy that basic linearity requirement. And if we're no longer dealing with uh, linear uh, functionals, uh, well, then the majority of the proofs that we're dealing with do no longer apply. So we're going to have to fix this issue. And the fix is actually not going to be so difficult. Uh, we're actually simply going to define a decomposition of our solution into a, any function that uh, satisfies uh, the GD boundary conditions and a new function. So how do we uh, solve this problem? What we're going to do is we're not going to look, or we're going to say now u is going to be equal to some function u gd plus u0. Where u gd is any function, and it really doesn't matter, any function in H1 that satisfies U G D is equal to G D on partial omega D. Yeah, so it's going to be any function that satisfies the Dirichlet data. And U0 is a member of the function H10, right? So that's going to be a function in the H1 subleft space uh, that uh, has zero Dirichlet data. So that means in the, that that means in the, or that, that we can then already see uh, that the sum of those two is also going to satisfy the Dirichlet condition, right? So one of the functions satisfies the condition that it's equal to GD on partial omega D, and the other one is zero on partial omega D. So their sum is going to be equal to GD on partial omega D. Now, if I do that. If I do that, and I, I fix my choice for UGD, then my variable is going to be U0. And I can actually phrase my weak formulation as find U0, right? That's the one that we're now looking for. And this is again a function in H10. Such that... So then we have the same bilinear form as we did before, but now acting on u0 and w. And it's going to be equal to the same linear form that we had before, but I'll, I'll still use a, a star here. Minus b u g d w. Yeah? So this is the one that, you know what, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, I'll go one step slower. Let me be clear where this came from. Yeah, okay. Uh, so my original statement was a uh, bilinear form of u, which is equal to u g d plus u zero, right? But put this definition above here, uh, times w is equal to L and I'll introduce a star here of W for all W in H10. Now, um, due to the bilinear uh, nature of the bilinear form, uh, this actually rewrites into uh, B of U0, W is equal to L star W minus B of U, G, D. W, right? And now this bilinear form here on the right, it no longer depends on, on, on our trial function, the function that we're looking for, u0, but rather it only depends on w and it depends on w in a linear way. Uh, so this again becomes now a new linear form and that's what we actually call our, our linear form LW. Yeah? So um, 
Yeah, let me let me write it out for the advection diffusion example. So we already saw that we had f times w, right? That's the one that we're familiar with now. Then we had also now our Neumann data in here. So we're introducing this uh, integration over the Neumann boundary of g n times w. But now we also have a whole bunch of additional terms uh, for which we have uh, a dot gradient of u g d w minus um, kappa gradient u g d gradient w for which we have substituted uh, this any function u uh, or any function in h1 that satisfies our Dirichlet data so now we see that the data uh, that we have introduced our forcing function f our norman boundary condition gn and our Dirichlet boundary condition gd all shows up in the li linear form either explicitly or implicitly so all data in the linear form and in the right hand side and uh, the, I think the most important point that I want to make here is that in all our analysis, what we're going to do is we're always going to assume the special case uh, where uh, we have zero Dirichlet data. Because we know that if we do not have zero Dirichlet data, then we can always rewrite it into a problem that does have uh, Dirichlet data. Yeah? And in fact, you would actually be able to rewrite this a little bit and then you would uh, actually be able to, to get... Uh, uh, to, to get to rewrite this in a different form of f yeah so um, that's what we'll always do we'll always consider the case of zero Dirichlet data because we know that uh, the other cases are can be rewritten into a case with zero Dirichlet data at least from the analysis perspective right? in practical applications you would of course uh, specify the Dirichlet data on the finite element space in some way but from the analysis perspective this will be the uh, the, the case that we will consistently consider. Okay, that's it. And then uh, in the next few videos, I'm going to start with actually uh, the analysis part now.